Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 2, segment 3. In a previous video, we talked a fair bit about different disk devices and how to connect them. In the process, we briefly mentioned a few configurations for how to combine individual disks into larger storage pools. So in this video, we'll pick up where we left off there and cover this concept of storage virtualization in a bit more detail. Now, when we hear the word virtualization, we often jump to certain assumptions and think about virtual machines and perhaps cloud services such as, obviously, AWS. But on a basic level, storage virtualization really boils down to simply separating individual physical storage media from a logical storage unit, meaning we might populate a large disk array with hard drives and then carve that up into virtual disks as needed. This is, in a way, the inverse approach from dividing a single hard drive into separate partitions, a concept we'll discuss in more detail in the next video. Here we will take a quick look at two different approaches to storage virtualization. A hardware-based approach, where a physical device may support and offer means to combine individual drives, such as a RAID appliance, and host-based solutions, whereby the operating system manages the physical storage devices and combines them using logical volume management. We also see two practical examples of logical volume management, the device mapper, commonly used for modern Linux systems, and ZFS, a file system that includes a storage virtualization layer. But let's start with RAID. As mentioned in the last video, what you see here is a now obsolete piece of hardware, an Apple X RAID appliance. I keep using this example picture because it's easy to immediately see how RAID works, a device offering a redundant array of independent disks or a redundant array of inexpensive disks, as it was originally known, provides housing for several individual hard drives, adds a management firmware to manage the drives, and connects to your storage area network via, for example, fiber channel. But just stashing the drives into the case is not quite enough. And this is where this differs from the JBot approach we mentioned in our last video. This is not just a bunch of disks, but RAID allows you to combine all the disks into a single virtual disk so that you can create a large file system that spans all disks. Another advantage offered by RAID devices is to improve I.O. efficiency by striping writes across all drives, thereby minimizing, for example, seek time on the hard drives. And thirdly, RAID provides for a certain amount of data redundancy, when instead of writing data across all drives, it mirrors data between subsets of the drives, thereby providing fault tolerance. Which is important, since we know that all things eventually fail, and the damaged hard drive should not lead to data loss if we can avoid it. So we see that we have several ways of combining and utilizing the disks in a RAID array. We use the following numeric levels to describe the different approaches. Level 0 through level 6 represent the most common solutions, and you can see the distinction in how data is written as described here. That is, at times, we consider I.O. performed on a physical block level, other times on a byte or bit level. Don't worry, we'll go into the details of what exactly a block is in this context in our next video, but perhaps it might be good to briefly summarize the most popular rate levels to illustrate the benefits they provide. So the simplest way to use multiple disks is to put them next to each other and then issue writes not to just one drive at a time, but to distribute the data across both drives. That is, when the file system issues a write operation, the RAID device will chop it up on a per block level and write the first block to disk 1, the second block to disk 2, the third block again to disk 1, the fourth block again to disk 2, and so on and so on. In this fashion, I.O. performance is increased, as you can read or write data double as fast as you could otherwise. However, there's one problem. If any one of these two disks fails, and from experience as well as simple probability, we understand that the more disks you have, the more likely it is that a disk will inevitably fail. Well, if this disk goes away, then you have lost half your data, and you're unlikely to be able to reconstruct what you lost. So RAID 0 provides I.O. performance benefits, but no fault tolerance. If you want to ensure that you don't lose your data in the case of disk failure, you could use a RAID 1 configuration. In this case, we have the RAID duplicate every block of data that your file system is asking it to write to disk, and it will write two copies. One to each disk at a time. Now, in this case, 
if you lose one of the disks, there's no problem. You still have all the data available on the other disk. Your RAID will alert you that it's now in degraded mode. You pop out the broken disk, replace it with a shiny new disk, and when you pop that disk in, your RAID will automatically copy all the data from disk 1 onto disk 2 and you're back in business without any downtime. So that's pretty neat. But of course, in this configuration, you're A, foregoing the benefit of I.O. improvements, and B, you effectively only get half the disk space of what you put into the system. For any one terabyte of file system space you want to have available, you need to put in two terabytes of storage. So instead of doing either a RAID level 0 or level 1 configuration, you might decide to do a RAID level 5, which combines I.O. performance with fault tolerance. It does that by striping the writes across multiple disks, with each write going to separate disks, but then also writing parity bits. Now these parity bits allow you to reconstruct the data in the case of disk corruption. Furthermore, RAID 5 distributes the parity bit across all disks, so that you can at any point lose any one of the disks without losing any of the data. Now, you could write all the parity bits onto one of the drives and still retain the same fault tolerance, but doing so, known as a RAID 4 configuration, incurs a performance penalty, which RAID 5 overcomes via this distribution. Now, with the RAID 5, you do need to have at least three disks, and you do not get a linear increase in disk space, as you had disks, as some space is reserved for the parity information, but by and large, this is a popular and efficient solution to increase performance while at the same time retaining fault tolerance. Now, of course, you see where this is going, right? You can combine these approaches in different ways, so if you want to have increased fault tolerance or increased performance, you don't have to choose any longer. That is, you can combine different RAID levels to get you a mirrored array of stripes, a striped array of mirrors, etc. etc. The firmware in the controller handles all this for you, and swapping disks while the system is running, so-called hot swapping, is one of those things that makes your little sysadmin heart happy as you see the blinking lights of the device as it rebuilds the array and saves your data. Quite useful such a redundant array of independent disks, I tell you. But the concept of RAID need not be implemented solely via special hardware devices. And, more generally speaking, any kind of storage virtualization can be performed using software, meaning the kernel exposes the hardware and then allows a piece of low-level software to manage it. This is often referred to as logical volume management, and in general terms, this is broken down into the management of the physical storage units, for example, hard drives or storage devices connected by a fiber channel, say. These units are divided into physical volumes, which then can be combined to form so-called logical volumes. These logical volumes may then spend multiple physical devices, providing a layer of abstraction from which the LVM, or logical volume manager, can then further combine or create logical volumes such that you could combine individual disks to create a larger volume in a JBoard-like fashion could allow for redundancy and fault tolerance by allowing faulty disks to be replaced without downtime, could allow for a file system to immediately and automatically be resized to grow when the new disk is added, to provide the same rate functionality we already discussed, or to automatically perform periodic snapshots of the file system, thereby offering a convenient live backup mechanism. We'll discuss file system snapshots in particular and backups more generally later in the semester. For now, let's briefly demonstrate what the use of a logical volume manager on a typical Linux system might look like. For that, we log into Linux Lab, where we observe two disks mounted. Dev SDA1 mounted under slash boot and what appears to be a map device as the root file system. The root file system thus does not sit on a regular disk partition, but appears to be managed via the device mapper, the basis underlying the logical volume manager in Linux. Let's look at the D message output relating to the disk. Here we see that def sda appears to be a SCSI disk that contains several partitions. The lsblock command shows us a bit more information about this block device. We have one 20-gig disk with the first partition mounted under boot, 
The second partition, devsda2, is an extended partition, so it only contains the meta information for devsda5, which itself is then divided into two subpartitions, both managed by the LVM. One partition for slash and one for swap. Swap-on confirms that the swap space available on the system is made available via the device mapper device devdm1. We'll look into the concepts around partitions in more detail in our next video, but as shown here, we can see the use of an LVM even for a very simple system with just a single disk. Another thing I wanted to demonstrate here was the use of ZFS to manage storage resources. ZFS is a file system originating from Suns, well, Oracle's nowadays, Solaris operating system. It is a fairly different file system from others, in that it includes all the bits for logical volume and storage pool management, as we will see. Let's start with a new screen session and spin up an OmniOS instance. OmniOS is a version of Illumos, an open source Unix system. It is based on Open Solaris, so the easiest way for you to run a Solaris variant. This AMI image here lets us get started. In our custom EC2 wait function, which you may recall from one of the warm-up exercise videos, lets us know when the system is up and running. All right, so let's log in. Here we are. Let's again look at the disk devices reported via D message. Here the disk is called XDF. Let's try out the format utility to look at the partition table for this disk. We find one disk identified using the historical SCSI addressing schema as controller1, target0, disk0, with individual partitions or slices in Solaris lingo then being referenced after this prefix. When we select this disk, however, we get a warning message. Slice 0 of this disk is part of an active ZFS pool, so we can't use the format utility here. DF confirms that our root file system appears to be located on the rpool ZFS pool. Let's take a look at that via the zpool tool. Here we see that indeed the rpool appears to be backed by that very disk, C1T0D0, giving us roughly 7.5 GB of disk space. ZFS list then shows us the file systems created on this pool, in a way similar to how the extended partition on the Linux system contained the root file system. Now, let's pretend that we're adding a new physical disk to our server here and want to create a second storage pool from those disks. For that, we run the AWS EC2 create volume command in a separate screen session. And create a one gigabyte volume. Then, we attach that volume to the instance. Wait, what was our instance ID again? Let's check what instances we have running with one of our aliases. There, let's grab this instance ID and continue. Now, let's repeat the same thing for a second volume, so we can pretend that we just hooked up two separate hard drives to our server. Okay, now back to our server. Looking at the D message output again, we now see that we have two more disks showing up. XDF0 remains the root file system, but now we also have XDF1 and XDF2. 
Note that when we used the AWS EC2 attach volume command, we specified a different device name. This is a bit confusing and annoying, because the device name we choose may not be what the OS on the instance uses, but so be it. Note also that we didn't have to reboot our instance. We could simply plug in our new hard drives into the live system, et voila, here are our disks. That's pretty cool. Anyway, let's see what disk info tells us. Ah, here they are. Our root disk, 8 gigs in size, and two new disks, C1T5D0 and C1T6D0. Now, let's create a new pool from these two disks. Let's call it extra. The zpool list shows us that our new extra pool combines the space from the two disks yielding roughly 1.9 GB. So there's always a little bit of overhead involved, so we didn't get the full 2 GB of space, but we do see how we can combine storage into a single pool. The ZFS list shows our file system, but we haven't even created one on our extra pool yet. So let's do that real quick. ZFS create extra space. There. Now let's tell the system where to mount this new file system. And here we go. New disk space now available under slash mount. We can write data into this file system now as we would expect. Okay, so far so good. But now let's pretend that we got our hands on yet another disk drive and want to add this to the pool. So we create another volume. Attach that just as before. And immediately, disk info shows the new disk present, C1T70. Our disk mounted on a slash mount has about 1.8 gigs of space. We add the newly attached disk to our existing zpool and bam, just like that, our mounted disk is now 2.7 gigs in size. So that's really cool, right? We didn't have to shut down the system to attach the disk and we didn't have to partition the disk or recreate the file system or anything. Simply adding the disk to the pool underlying the file system gets us extra space. I hope that this gave you an impression of the flexibility and power of ZFS, and how this illustrates the concept of storage virtualization, as we're now using storage units in a very flexible manner to combine and create file systems. All right, time for a break again. I want to make sure that you follow along with these examples. So here's another set of exercises I recommend for you. Create an OmniOS instance and use ZFS to create different types of pools. ZFS supports all the concept we talked about, and you can use it to increase performance by striping data, increase fault tolerance by mirroring data, or a combination of these via something called RAID Z. Once you've created such a pool and mounted the file system, simulate a hard drive failure by detaching the EBS volume. How does the system handle this? Next, think about how the system behaves if we add a disk. Adding a disk adds space, so growing the file system seems an easy enough thing to do. But what if you were to remove a disk? Can you shrink a file system in this manner? Seems possible so long as the data on the file system still fits into the new pool, but what if that's not the case? As you can tell, there are a number of things you can play around with here, and I hope that you will explore the concepts from this video in this way. If you run into problems or have questions, don't hesitate to ask for help. Okay, that's it for today. Next time, we'll talk about the physical structure of traditional hard drives, as well as continue a discussion of different partitions that we already hinted at a little bit today. Until then, thanks for watching. Cheers.